Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the second day of the Knight Smart Cities Lab. I'm Kelly Jin, and I serve as Vice President for Communities and National Initiatives at the Knight Foundation. For those of you who joined us yesterday, welcome back, and I hope you enjoyed our discussions on the current state and future state of civic engagement, broadband and digital inclusion, as well as equitable recovery in public spaces. Uh, and for those of you who are just joining us today, uh, welcome. You're on the second and last day of our very exciting uh, conference and discussions. I hope that uh, also yesterday evening, some of you enjoyed learning more about the incredible work of Knight Foundation grantees at the Expo Hall as well. Today's conversations will focus on local and national work in mobility. Specifically, you'll hear from speakers that are working at the forefront of autonomous vehicles as well as ride shares. And where I really want to highlight though today is that the through line of the work that you see through all of these conversations is how institutions and governments alike are seeking to work inclusively, equitably, and really by engaging with residents and the public. And should be no surprise to all of you listening in these are also the core principles and values that we have here at the Knight Foundation and are expressed through our work and through our investments. We focus our investments in Knight cities, in total 26 US cities where the Knight brothers themselves owned and operated newspapers. Together, they represent to me the fabric and diversity of America. From the streets of Lexington, Kentucky to Detroit, Michigan, to Miami, Florida, where I am here today and where our headquarters of the foundation are located. And yet, despite differences in the size, shape, makeup, economies, demographics of all of these communities, what Knight's communities have in common is that they have one foot firmly planted in their history and the present, and yet are also defining the future of cities and looking ahead. This means that City Hall should always be there, but residents and businesses shouldn't have to go to City Hall in person or during business hours for key government services. There should be a digital City Hall that's always there for them 24 seven. Like in the city of St. Paul, where the city has worked in partnership with the Beck Center to leverage open data to deal with pandemic related housing challenges. This also means that communities by default invest in more accessible public spaces because they deeply value public spaces as assets to increase resident attachment, like our work in partnership with the city of San Jose through their Guadalupe River Park initiative. And this also means that local financial institutions and governments are increasing capital and access to capital to help entrepreneurs build businesses and to close the wealth gap in communities, like in Macon, Georgia, where Newtown Macon is advancing through uh, local funding and revolving loan programs to support downtown small businesses. These are just a few of the examples across Knight communities. Um, you'll definitely hear more later today on how we envision the future of communities and the future of smart cities uh, nationally and globally as well. Uh, so for today's conversation, um, I am very excited to welcome up to the stage Andrew Hawkins, who is going to host our very first panel conversation uh, today on mobility and equity. Andrew, welcome. It is fantastic to have you. Thanks for moderating the session. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's an honor to be here. Um, this is a, a great panel that we have uh, 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 about, to, about to start, so I hope that everyone's really excited for what I hope is a very vibrant and uh, relevant discussion. Uh, my name is Andrew Hawkins. I am a senior transportation reporter at The Verge, um, where I've been reporting on transportation issues, especially autonomous vehicles for the last six years. 
Um, and uh, I'm really excited to, to get this discussion going. So I'm gonna start by introducing uh, our panel. Uh, first, I'm just gonna sort of say their names and I'm going to allow them to introduce themselves because they are sort of better equipped at describing what they do than I would be. Um, so first off, we're gonna talk to um, Jenny Larios Berlin. She is the co-founder and CEO, COO of Optimus Ride. Jenny, thank you so much for being here with us. Of course, it's a pleasure to be here. So uh, as Andrew said, I'm uh, Jenny Lyers Berlin, uh, co-founder and COO of Optimus Ride. Um, at Optimus Ride, we try to partner with communities uh, to uh, provide them with uh, shared electric and autonomous mobility services, both for intra and inter-community uh, access and connections. Uh, prior to that, I was at MIT I was doing a double master's in urban planning and business. Uh, you know, there's really big, hairy, audacious problems um, in the urban space. And uh, my particular interest was in, in transportation. But how do we use business tools um, uh, to, to address them? And how do we partner and build bridges? Um, so I was really keen on that. And then, uh, and that's where I met my co-founders, actually, some from the city science initiatives, others uh, from the computer science and artificial uh, lab. Prior to that, I was at Zipcar. Uh, where I worked with ride sharing both at universities and also uh, helping to deploy them um, at an at a international scale. So happy to be with you here today to talk about mobility and equity. Fantastic. All right. Next, we've got Henry Greenwich. He is a fellow at the NYU McSilver Institute. Henry, please describe to us what you do. Thanks, Andrew, and thanks to the Knight Foundation for having me on this uh, wonderful panel. Uh, so I'm currently the managing director at Tusks Ventures, uh, where I focus on mobility, sustainability, and broadband, uh, but I wear a few other hats. Um, I'm also at NYU, the McSilver Institute for Policy uh, poverty uh, research, uh, where we focus on the connection between transportation uh, and poverty. Um, it is something that uh, McSilver has just sort of started to take a look at how transportation impacts black communities, uh, something that we felt was uh, lacking. Um, I am also the founder of Our Mobility Future, which is a consultancy that works with cities, uh, tech companies, and really focuses on diversity and inclusion initiatives. Um, for me, really happy to be talking about this topic. Um, I was first introduced to autonomous vehicles 10 years ago when I was working at USDOT. Google brought one of their self-driving cars uh, to our facility and it just blew my mind away really because of uh, the opportunity that we had. Um, for me, at that time, it was more of an access issue. I, I was having issues catching cabs in New York City. I was having issues catching cabs when I got back uh, to DC. Uh, and I realized later on, but it, it's not just about access, it's really about opportunity. So really looking forward to having this conversation and talking about what kind of opportunities uh, this presents for communities. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, so last but not least, we've got Carlos Cruz Casas. He is the Assistant Director for Strategic Planning at Miami-Dade's County of Transportation and Public Works. Carlos, welcome. Thank you, Andrew. And as you mentioned, uh, and I, I often say that is somewhat of a long and ugly name, the fact that you have Assistant Director of the Department of Transportation and Public Works for Miami-Dade County. The way I like to phrase it is more of a mobility management agency, as that's what we do. It really do justice, uh, the work that we do. We manage all traffic signals and signs, traffic engineering, highway engineering, bicycle pedestrian, transit planning, transit operations, and even the regulatory arm for for higher vehicles like taxis and limos, and before the state preempted us, Ubers and Lyft. So think about it, everything that moves in Miami-Dade County. My role to keep it simple and get into the conversation is mostly about bringing mobility innovation to our community. And that can mean a lot of things often confused with technology, but it's mostly about how we address the problems we have on hand. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here today to talk about how cities and private sector can, can be participants of this. One of the additional roles that I play today also is a current board member of the Open Mobility Foundation, which is, we can elaborate a little bit later, but it's something that can help bring cities and private sector together as well. That's great. Well, thank you all for being here. Uh, I thought I'd start this out, this discussion out by doing a bit of a vibe check, as the kids like to say. Um, so raise your hand if you have ridden in an autonomous vehicle before. All right. So this is not a representative sample, I would say, <laughs> of the vast majority of the people in this country. Uh, autonomous vehicles are still very much limited in terms of their availability to the public. 
Uh, they are uh, mostly in a research and development and a testing phase in most cities around the world. But still, uh, we are getting slowly closer to uh, reaching a point where more people will have experienced autonomous vehicles. And I want to get a sense just to start out with uh, when you all think um, we're going to start to see more mass adoption, more deployments, because there have been sort of predictions in the past about when we're going to start to see more autonomous vehicles on the streets. Uh, some of those have not really come, uh, to, come to fruition. Uh, I'm going to start with you, Jenny. When do you think that we're going to start to see more autonomous vehicles on the road uh, than, than there currently are today? And I think you're, you're muted, Jenny, so if you can please unmute yourself. Um, so uh, thanks, Andrew. You know, this is a question that always keeps coming up in the industry. Uh, when, when, when? Um, it, the truth of the matter is it's, it's in the hows um, because uh, the technology is being deployed in so many different ways. Um, for example, right now, we do have a publicly accessible program at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. We, we have had folks come in from the ferry and then hop into it. Um, and so th that's publicly open. We have another service in, in DC, but still to, to your point, it's um, how is this gonna sort of grow over time? And it's really based on how these will be deployed. Um, you have certain players that are doing delivery, um, you know, partnering with folks uh, like Domino's and others. And so I think folks will start to see those vehicles uh, on their in their neighborhood streets. Uh, you have others who are looking at long haul trucking. Um, and so there's, you know, you, you might be able to see some of those vehicles if you're doing road trips and things of that nature. Um, you know, there's always these different features of autonomy in the Tesla vehicle that, you know, if folks have, have those, they will talk about them. Some folks, uh, folks will even post them on Instagram. Um, and, um, and and then you have uh, folks like ourselves, right, who are focused on partnering with, with communities and then uh, deploying them for the specific needs there. Um, and so it, I, I think if you cut it in different ways, um, we are starting to see some of that. But if we're talking about, you know, um, autonomous vehicles that can do anything and everything under the sun, you know, uh, inclement weather, um, long distances, short speeds, high speeds, complex urban environments, that is going to be a ways off because what happens is you have sort of a bell curve of, um, technology development where you have sort of the majority of issues, but it's those long tails of unpredictability that make it really hard um, to, to have a fully robust technology that can go out in the market and, and sort of be a system that's in your regular vehicle. Um, so when we talk about those, we're really still looking at 20 years maybe, um, because we really want to make sure that for those vehicles that are going to do everything, that they're safe. Uh, and we want to make sure that we understand what safety means, both in the industry, but also with our public policymaker partners um, so, that, so that it gets rolled out accordingly. But I do think that we are going to start to see in different ways um, these uh, appear in, in our communities even today. So that, I think that's a, those are really great points, and, and I want to turn to to Carlos now because I want uh, someone from the from a city perspective, someone who has you know boots on the ground essentially. If you could maybe just help us sort of uh, get an understanding of what the problem is. So when we talk about inequity in transportation, what specifically are we talking about? Yeah, and, and that's very broad, right? And I think that's when we talk about inequities, can be looking different point of views, right? Um, and and I think to me is. First, we need to really understand what, what, what the role of transportation is and what the role of public sector and private sector can provide to help move people around, right? Uh, nobody wakes up in the morning and say, I want to ride the metro rail all day, right, from downtown to Kendall. But they say, I need to go to the office, I need to go to work, I need to go and buy a grocery and stuff. So the mobility and transportation is not about the, the mode, it's more about where you need to go and, and get around with your business, right? And I think the some of the aspects that we see in the inequities uh, from from transportation uh, is is more about the the right in the use of the public right of way, right? And and to me is everyone every time that we look at uh, problems in terms of mobility and innovation, we need to start talking about the, the how we're going to impact. It. For example, I hear often that the cars are being improved and the vehicle personal use being improved over the years with. Um, 
have gotten faster, have gotten bigger, have gotten more protective for the people inside the vehicle, which you might say, bringing the cost down of those particular vehicles will help inequity, but at the same time, you're creating inequities for people outside the vehicles, right? So to me, I wanna explore more on how we are leveraging the best and probably the most abundance public right away that we have the public space in our cities and how we can allow for people to carry on with the mobility options that they choose in a safely manner so if you start talking about can i go or can i instead of talking about a car can go from zero to 60 seconds in three in 60 miles an hour in three seconds it's crash tested you have seven airbags or you have 14 uh cup holders can we talk about more? Can I cross the street of Biscayne Boulevard from one side to another with zero chance of fatality? Can I can I ride my bicycle on a bike lane without without being door or without being clipped by the truck on the corner? So to me, the inequities that we need to start exploring is not necessarily only on the provision of transportation, but the space and the space that we allocate for it. And I think that's a role for public agencies. We do see ourselves as custodians of the public right away to be able to manage the demand of public right away in time, space, and mode. And right now I see a big disparate impact between people riding on a car versus people walking and biking. And I wanna explore that more on AVs because a lot of AVs is more about people using it and rightfully so with limited mobility and other aspects that we wanna explore on AV. But at the same time, the people walking, people biking, the people accessing transit, they're also gonna see benefits. And, and that to me is the role that I wanna tap in as a public agency. How can ensure that everyone in Miami-Dade County can really enjoy it on the public right away, can really do whatever they wanna do in our county, which is a phenomenal place to be and feel safe, not feel fear of what can happen on the streets. So I wanna bring sort of both of those two responses together and ask you, Henry, um, you know, Jenny's talked about how, you know, we have these limited deployments now, but it's probably still going to be a long time before we see autonomous vehicles that can drive anywhere under any conditions. Whereas Carlos is talking about how there's a very obvious need today uh, for improved safety uh, in our cities. Do you think that there is an opportunity for AVs sort of in the limited uh, abilities that they have now? They're still sort of in these sort of testing phases that they can start to uh, have a positive benefit to uh, equity and safety on streets, or is it just too soon to, to tell, would you say? Absolutely. So I think number one, through proof of concept, we still need to prove to everyday people that this uh, concept of autonomous vehicles is real. There's still a tremendous amount of skepticism. Um, folks don't feel safe right now by the concept of autonomous vehicles. Um, I think back to what Jenny said, what's really important here is the education when we're talking about trying to figure out when we're actually going to see cars on the road. Um, you, you know, you can go to Brooklyn Navy Yard now and see uh, Optimus ride, right? Um, you know, Ford and Argo announced that they're, they're launching in Miami, DC, and a couple other places. And so you'll see them on the roads. There, there are companies doing goods delivery. Um, but the first thing we've got to do is say, hey, uh, American public, when we're talking about autonomous, autonomous vehicles, here's what we're talking about. We're talking about robo taxis uh, with Ford and, and Argo, or we're talking about AV shuttle uh, with Optimus Ride. So I think that's first. Uh, but my answer is uh, very similar to what Jenny said. I think it's 20 years. I think my answer is based on a couple of things. Number one, it's uh, the public perception and earning the public trust. Um, I think it's also an infrastructure issue. And so I don't see robo taxis uh, as, as our, our streets are, are currently laid out uh, being successful. Um, to your question about fulfilling needs today, um, I absolutely think that autonomous vehicles can um, fulfill a need today. I think we've seen that, especially with goods deliveries uh, for uh, uh, companies that have chosen to do that. Um, AV trucking is hot right now. There's a lot of investment there. Um, we're looking forward to seeing more pilots. And I think we're we're going to see that uh, sooner than later uh, because it, we need to fill a, a labor gap there. And so there, there's tons of um, uh, benefits uh, right now. There is a long lead time to deployment, but there's still stuff that we need to do in terms of making the case that AVs are really the direction that we need to be going. I think uh, first, we need to talk about this inequity thing and acknowledge sort of where, where we are with transportation and what what we've done to to separate people and to oppress people and why our transportation ecosystem is uh, what it is today. Uh, then we can talk about how autonomous vehicles can uh, fulfill those needs and really um, address those needs in a way that we, we just haven't seen before. 
in, in, in Andrew, if I may, uh, Go ahead. I do agree with everything that's been said. The only thing I would probably add is autonomous vehicle technology that can be applied to vehicles of all sizes. Right. So, so definitely, you know, I wouldn't mm -hmm. expect to have, you know, and again, you know, it's just sedans or, or basically SUVs is running around and be the ultimate solution for mobility in a city as dense as Miami-Dade County or on New York and other places where I really to understand that ultimately there is a role for public transportation and mass transportation to play. And that can be applied. Autonomous vehicle technology can be applied to AV. It already happens. We've been having a fully automated people moving in downtown Miami for the last 30, 40 years, right? There is autonomous, you know, um, you know, um, light rail and subways in all the places of the of the country and the nation, right? So, so it is it is important for us to think about that and, and focus about it is just a way to deliver a mobility solution. But ultimately, the mobility solution is something that we need to build with the community and making sure that it aligns with the goals and objectives that we have. Ultimately, re reducing the footprint is critical. Ultimately, making people safe is critical and be more efficient. Like I said, we're custodian the public right away. We need to make sure that it's used to the best use possible and, and make sure that it's aligned with the community. So I, I think that's a really great point because I'm reminded of how cities have responded in recent years to the uh, proliferation of electric scooters, shared electric scooters in cities across the country. Uh, and you know, initially they were sort of everywhere and they were getting in the way and then cities realized that they could they had a lot of leverage and they uh, basically sketched out, you know, permitting processes for, for scooters that they had to deploy in certain areas to address inequity issues, or they weren't allowed in other areas where there was, where there was more uh, too much congestion, for example. So I'm wondering if you guys think that cities should take a similar approach with autonomous vehicles. Should they say to the companies that are deploying these, these, uh, these vehicles, you want to come into our city? That's great. You need to be a last mile, first mile, last mile solution. Uh, in this specific neighborhood, which has lack, which lacks public transportation, you can connect people uh, to subways, to buses. Uh, should that be, you think, uh, a, a requirement for deployment? Uh, mm -hmm. Jenny, I'll ask you that first as, a, as our, our private sector representative on, on the stage. I mean, uh, I think it's always about partnership and it's always about listening um, to the places that you're going. Um, kind of to, to Carlos' point is, you know, how you cross Key Biscayne Boulevard is probably different from how you cross uh, Storo Drive in Boston. Um, and so it's how do we um, first recognize that we're all in the same boat, right? Like we we're all uh, care about transportation. We all care about improving access and making things affordable and convenient for people. And so then what does that then mean for each of the of the of the locations and then partnering in those ways? You know, one of the things that, that we've done on the education front working with Boston is uh, attending uh, robotic petting zoos, for example, where, you know, you can essentially this can be a traveling zoo. It can go to, to different places. It can go to uh, technical high schools. It can go to elementary schools. It can go to the town square. Um, and, and then you use that to, to educate and then say, tell us what your needs are. Because for some cities, it's, you know what, I really want to know about my, my curb access and I want to know about my potholes and I want to know where stop signs are missing. Okay, great. So then we can partner in with the information that we're collecting to share that. For others, it's, you know, the access. And so is, is it access to light rail? Is it access to mass transit? Is it access to, to the bus systems? Um, and it is the case, right, that generally uh, low income communities get keep getting pushed out and out. And so then it's about having a bus network that supports them. And then how do we plug into that bus network? How do we sort of understand, okay, well, this is the peak and the low peak, but how do we provide for all times because that's the other things that happen in our in our communities which is you know i mean i grew, I'm, I'm first generation latina so i grew up in in some low-income communities myself and you know you'd have buses that you'd have to wait 30 minutes for not by design it's just that that's sort of what the system can support but how do you use systems like ourselves where you have the cost effectiveness of public transit but the convenience of a ride share and so then you can <clears throat> connect folks to those transportation hubs or the supermarket i remember carrying a lot of grocery bags uh, home um, and, and those are just short trips but they are the convenient trips because frankly most of our lives is three to maybe five miles radius from our homes. And so then how do we think about what those needs are and, and then respond to those? And, and I think that's the most important thing when, with, when you think about 
permitting and regulation is how do you give enough flexibility to, to the, 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 the local policymakers so that they have the freedom to say, this is what my community needs and this is how I want to work with you. Uh, Henry, I'll, I'll, I'll shoot that question to you and also just sort of yeah. add that, um, you know, uh, there will be some tension that exists between uh, the, the city governments and the AV companies, I think, uh, as, as this technology becomes more uh, uh, advanced and, and available in the future. What do you think is sort of going to, how do you think that that's going to play out? What leverage do cities have in terms of what they're going to be asking from the AV companies and what are the AV companies likely, how are they likely to respond, do you think, to some of those requests? Yeah, I think today, um, oh, I'm not on mute, great. Um, I think today cities have a lot more leverage than they did in the past. They've certainly learned uh, their lessons from other technologies deploying in cities, uh, Airbnb, Uber, um, I think cities have gotten smarter. Um, I agree with Jenny, you do need partnership and I do think you need to have um, uh, a mutual understanding, if you will. I think cities, as, as you have amazingly talented people who work in cities, especially on transportation, but at the same time, many of them have not worked in the private sector and many of them have not worked at AV technology companies. And so there needs to be education there. They And, and the AV companies need to be proactive in doing sort of the, the these petting zoos and these, these road shows to ensure that the city uh, stakeholders have the proper education here. But I am in big favor of a framework. I I think you need a framework uh, that the AV companies need to abide by. And the reason for that simply is I'm concerned about equity issues. And I'm, I'm concerned that equity will be put to the wayside in favor of business decisions. And we've seen that um, happen time and time again. Um, and I would also say that, you know, there are some great people who work at AV companies, uh, but we all know that there are pressures out there, financial or otherwise, with uh, competition, uh, that often cause uh, good decisions to be left behind in favor of a good business uh, decision. And equity is too important uh, right now to forego that. Um, I've often been told that you know uh, AV is the sort of biggest uh, engineering uh, challenge of our lifetime. Um, I also think that inclusion is the biggest uh, social uh, challenge of our lifetime and we need to address that and we need to address that now. For many communities, this is a matter of life or death. And I think that uh, with AV technology, especially um, AV technology that is clean, uh, I'm talking about uh, electric vehicles, um, you can really change the quality of life in some of these communities. and But what that really means is it, it makes a difference in people's lives. And so from that perspective, I do think you need the government to sort of step up and play their role as uh, the steward uh, of the public interest and really develop a framework uh, that works to, um, to, to meet the needs of autonomous vehicles and the public in which they, they serve. Um, and I do think uh, there are ways to streamline that. There are ways uh, to accelerate uh, progress so that you don't get hampered by the uh, permitting process. Um, and I think all of those things uh, need to be discussed with a, 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 a um, wide array of stakeholders from both the private, uh, public, and nonprofit sectors. So I'll just quickly note that if, uh, if folks who are watching this panel want to learn more about the Knight Foundation's AV Public Engagement Initiative, there will be a workshop scheduled later today. So please check that out if you want to learn more. Um, so, uh, Carlos, let me, I think Henry brought up a really great point that there is, you know, a, a lot of opportunity here, but also a, a lot of risk, um, especially if, you know, uh, these private companies that are operating the AV company, uh, AV, uh, the AVs, uh, you know, tend to uh, prioritize profit over things like inclusion uh, and equity. And I'm wondering what you think will be sort of the best response that cities should have to ensure that these tech companies, uh, that, that that doesn't happen, that they sort of operate within sort of defined parameters, that they still have flexibility to recoup their expenses and make money off of these services because they are private companies. They're sinking a lot of money into these into this mm -hmm. technology, but at the same time, there are some very obvious needs <clears throat> to be addressed. Yes, um, Andrew, so many thoughts are going on right now through my head. I think this is a phenomenal conversation. There's a lot to unpack here. You know, the, the first thing that, that I can probably tap into is, you know, communities don't need a parade of, of shiny objects, new technologies, right? You know, we need partners to help us uh, basically uh, achieve our goals and mitigate the impacts that we have today. 
right? So to, to me, the first thing we to do is, like Jenny mentioned, is instead of ha having a solution, looking for a problem to solve, let's be working together and, and highlight and voice those needs and problems that we have today, right? And not necessarily me as a, as a public, uh, a member of the, the public agency, right? As a public servant, but from the community, right? Even in cities, in Miami-Dade County is huge, being in the same states, right? Even within Miami-Dade County, even within the 34 municipalities of Miami-Dade County, everyone experiences mobility differently, experiences the city differently, right? I use transit, and I've been in this vehicle, but my neighbor probably has experienced the, the mobility in a different way. So first we need to really understand that. We really need to provide them with a voice to be participating in this conversation, um, and then be prepared. Right, I, I don't have a time for when AV is going to continue to roll out as mass. Yes, we're going to have. We already have Ford here for four years. We have a great partnership with them. You know, now they're going to be rolling out robo taxis later on this year. Um, in mass, I don't, I don't, I don't know. But the one thing I want to make sure is that we are prepared as a community, that the people are educated in general, and that we're able to voice our concerns and, 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 and liking of the new technology coming in to the private sector so they can adapt their mobility solutions to, to, to where we are, right, and the goals that we want to do, right? Uh, at the same time, I think we need to really understand uh, how this is different. I don't want to alienate AVs from everything else, right? If we, if we don't have yet a, a, a basically a requirement for TNCs or microtransit or micromobility to address equity, why are we doing that in AV? And I think we need to take a step back and say mobility as a whole needs yeah. to abide by the goals and objectives of our community. And we need to work together towards that. AV is just another way to deliver it. And we're going to get, again, a potential better partnership through it because we get a lot of more information perhaps in terms of, of some of the, the sensor uh, abilities of it. You know, there is things the cities are doing to address this, right? Uh, the first thing, for example, in a, in a great partnership that we have with Ford and Jenny, you mentioned, you know, the Domino's Pizza and, and the, those uh, pilots, you know, think about this. If the pizza delivery guide is no longer going three flights of stairs to go to your door and give you the pizza, you need to go down to the street and pick it up. The interaction and the space on the, on the public right away changes. Mm -hmm. The needs of the curb space changes, the sidewalk furniture potentially need to change. All these things we need to think about, nothing to do with technology, nothing to do with the AV itself, but if you're gonna change anything on our community, it needs to be done that way. And the last thing I wanna mention in terms of what cities can do, and, and, and I urge everyone to follow uh, the Open Mobility Foundation, which is an organization that's led by cities. And what they're doing is the stewardship of a, a component called mobility data specification. In short, is the ability for cities to deliver policies through APIs. And I say that because AV company, mm -hmm. basically they can really understand our city from an API point of view, from a computer computer communication, instead of trying to read a sign that says, no parking here, parking there, you know, 10 minutes there, 15 minutes here. We can do this, right? Our role, and again, I have no purview over the technology. I have no purview whether this, the wheels are round or square. I don't have nothing like that. But the one thing I know it is I do have purview over what is the use of the public right of way and how the curb is utilized, how long they can stay there, you know, the speed that they can traverse and whether or not they can go in one direction or the other, right? Those local traffic rules are under the purview of cities. And I think we need to be a little bit more vocal about that and the role, and the role that cities can do. And yes, there's in inequities that we need to do in terms of provide better mobility solutions throughout. Uh, a community like Miami Dade County, regardless of the color of our skin or the accent of our voices, but then it's to apply to all mobility options. And to me, is yes, I think you know we're looking to provide a clear indication of what we're doing as a public agency, better transportation system, better inclusion, and show where we are running short. Where are the areas that might be a transit desert? But can should never be a mobility desert where Optimus can actually come in. And if you want to come and help a community, you want to be a participant of the of, of the Miami Dade on the rise, this is the area that you can come in. So I think there's a lot there to unpack. And I'm really thrilled about you know this baby steps, you know, and yes, it's gonna take years, but it's baby steps for us to better understand the interaction between moving people and regardless of the mode that they are and the people that are walking and biking and the needs that they have. And if we're able to just working together and thinking of AV, what applied today to our partnership with VIA, to our partnership with Uber and Lyft, to our partnership with anyone else there, you talk about micro trend, micro mobility, 
all those needs to be understood about the same level and be uh, following the same rules, if you will. I wanted to just ask you guys really quick about um, the problem of traffic congestion. Uh, it's uh, a major issue for uh, uh, pretty much every city in the in the country today. Um, and it is potentially getting worse as a result of the pandemic uh, with people uh, shifting away from public transportation into privately owned vehicles. Uh, it, it seems like there's the potential for uh, a, a looming uh, congestion disaster. Um, EVs are an interesting component to this because um, while they uh, have a lot of uh, promise, uh, they are still uh, just another car on the road in, in many use cases. Uh, and the geometry uh, is essentially uh, still the same. You have, the, uh, you, it's not going to solve the geometry problem that exists uh, with when it comes to congestion. So I wanted to ask you, Jenny, um, what you think in terms of uh, the future and equity, uh, th if there should be certain policies put in place in cities such as congestion pricing, uh, and how you think that that would affect uh, the uh, the operation of EVs in certain cities if such policies were enacted? Yeah, well, I guess I'll just start with um, from my transportation planning days, uh, congestion is a good thing in the sense that, you know, it kind of sends a signal that maybe you shouldn't be driving your car. Um, and, and it also slows things down, which again, from sort of as an urbanist, uh, we believe in vision zero. <laughs> Uh, we, we believe that cities should be going slow because you want to, Carlos's point, make room for bikers. You want to make room for walkers. You want to make room for families. You want to make room for children. You know, I have a nine-year-old and I, I think about, you know, just the work that it takes me to teach him to be afraid of cars. Why do we have to do that? Because we've enabled an infrastructure that does that. In, instead of um, as a human scale and say, no, we're going to take ownership back of our city and we're going to make it such that we can bike, we can walk, we can scoot um, and, and then have lower speed vehicles that are shared. Not everybody needs a driver's license. And so to your point on the congestion, I, I, I defer to my policy friends on whether we should do congestion and pricing or not. But when I see congestion, I'm like, OK, I think that this is going to force people to think, oh, there was a reason why I had been using public transit before COVID. Maybe I can try that again. And if we have solutions that make it easier to do sort of multimodal, because sometimes you tend to chain your trips, right? If you're walking or you take your bus or, 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 or you're walking and you take a scooter or what have you, um, how do we, to, to Carlos's point earlier, uh, solve for that access? Because it's not about the, what they're doing to get there. It's about the destination for folks. And so how do we sort of think about AVs from the angle of solving that issue? How do we share? How do we um, electrify our fleets? How do we distribute these vehicles so that they can provide better support for our mass transit systems? Because the truth of the matter is that there's still no better system built to date that can move high volumes of people other than mass transit. And so for cities, it really is, you know, um, how do we leverage congestion to get people back out of their cars again and, and remind them of the, the, the beautiful options that they have that can also be much healthier. I love the, the, the idea that people stuck in traffic are uh, enlightened enough to realize that they are themselves contributing to that traffic. But I wonder if that's actually the reality. Um, uh, there was, I, I remember there was some onion article many, many years ago that, that addressed that, you know, everyone's mad at everyone else in traffic except for themselves. Um, but I want to, we have about 15 minutes left. So I want to uh, get to some of the questions that we've been getting from from our audience. Um, and I thought first we could talk about um, about the use, the, sort of the, the, the term equity uh, and, and what that means and the idea that self-driving cars and autonomous vehicles um, uh, could potentially uh, be eliminating jobs. There are lots of people who work in the ride sharing industry today in mass transit, driving buses, driving shuttles, driving taxis. The idea that autonomous vehicles could potentially uh, pose a, a threat to that labor that exists today, the people that work in those fields. Um, and you know, what sort of obligation the AV companies or cities might have um, to ensure that people sort of aren't left in the lurch if they lose their jobs as a result of autonomous vehicles. 
Uh, and I thought maybe Henry, you could you could talk about that first. Sure. Um, so you mentioned the term equity, and and Carlos said it. This is such a broad term, uh, and you also mentioned labor, um, which is related, but we can go a completely separate direction. So number one, when I'm talking about equity, I'm talking about um, impacts to black people and other people of color. Um, there are all sorts of inequity out there. Uh, you know, it's 51 years since we passed the ADA, right? Um, there, 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 are, there are all sorts of ways that you can look at um, pay inequity, particularly at AV companies uh, when it comes to gender and things like that. Um, but really when I'm talking about uh, inequity, that's how I'm using the word. Uh, I'm talking about black people and other people of color. Um, and that is on purpose because at NYU McSilver, we have said that we haven't seen enough of those issues being focused on in these communities. And we see a lot of mobility technology being deployed and more on the way. And so there needs to be focus on those issues. Um, with respect to labor, this is this is a huge one for me. I, I think the AV companies bear responsibility uh, to talk about this. This is a real thing. It's not going to go away. It is something that's going to be exacerbated by their technology. Um, people are going to be in, 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 impacted by it. And I think uh, they owe it to everyone to sort of be proactive in these conversations. Uh, you know, it, it, it's probably not a welcoming idea to talk to labor unions and things like that about these issues, but I think you need to address them head on. And I think that we're so early in the technology that if we have meaningful conversations, there are some things that we can get to agreement on. And you also have to acknowledge that you're not going to uh, agree on everything and you're not going to get buy-in from everyone. But I think ignoring the issue only makes it worse and it reduces um, you know, the, the number of benefits that you can actually fulfill. Um, so labor is, is a huge one. I, I think that um, people are interested in this topic. Uh, I think people of color who, who understand what's happening are, are interested in it. On the other hand, I do think that anytime you have um, the introduction of new technology, you, you, you do phase out some part of the workforce. Um, if you, I, I wrote an article maybe a, a year or two ago about uh, elevator operators. I used to think that was the coolest job in the world as a kid, and I, I'm dating myself, but we used to go to Macy's and there was a pleasant man who operated the elevator. I remember learning to drive and and, and being nervous about uh, uh, slowing down for the uh, the toll booth clerk. Um, how often do you see that? Uh, I've got Easy Pass now. Um, and so you do see the disappearance of jobs uh, because of technology. But what happens is it's over time. It's not overnight. Um, and that is what history has sort of taught us. And But I think with AV, because of how unique it is, you do have to address the labor issue head on. And I do think there will be new jobs. Um, and you have to prepare the workforce for that. And so I go back to education and I'm really oversimplifying uh, the term education. What I really mean by that is outreach uh, and, and meaningful engagement so that we can prepare the next generation of folks for those next jobs. Um, and, and you can start interests uh, at, at the, the, the K through 12 uh, level, uh, preparing for a, a world where autonomous vehicles are, are the norm. Yeah, Carlos, let me ask you the, the basically the same question. I mean, you look at the the, the demographic of folks that make up the, the the people who are drivers today, who are rideshare drivers, delivery drivers, truck drivers. Uh, you're going to find a lot of people who are first generation immigrants, people who uh, English is not their sec their first language, people of color. Uh, how do we make sure that these people are not left in, in the in the in the dust as uh, things start moving towards uh, autonomous technology? Yeah, I know that's definitely a, a topic that is in mind, right? I often consider that as the giraffe in the room, right? It is it is hard for us to start thinking about that without really understanding, you know, what is kind of the future of this technology and how they can help in our uh, in our cities. Uh, I like to think about it not necessarily as a, as a problem, but more as an opportunity, right? What are those things that we have in our community that we're not able to fulfill today because we don't have enough staff? Right, we, we don't have enough people to do right. We we'll love to to really kind of create programs for ambassadors. We we'll love to create program where you know we are a, a front facing element, uh, making people feel welcome into our into our um, transportation systems. Right, you know we do have the need to keep that in mind to think about you know even in a well established system, there is always the need for human interaction. 
there's always the need to have people in, in, engaged. So to me, there's there's a lot for us to learn. You know, there's a lot also of new potentially high paying job that can be brought into right. You know, there's a lot of you know. I don't know if you guys have seen the the ins and outs of the AV. There's a lot of computing power in it. There's a lot of moving little parts again. You know, that need to be served right, and they need to start looking into. And I'm hoping that we can continue to create programs where we can actually maintain these vehicles and these vehicles and this technology it is something that is expensive and the best thing we can do is to make sure that we keep them operating as long as possible during the entire day that means a lot of servicing through it right so we see a lot of potential things about uh, you know maintenance you know light maintenance we're looking about cleaning crews and all that there's a lot of potential opportunities for us to keep that because today you know we know someone drop a, a, a soda can in the car right on, on on your vehicle but if there's no one present well you know, how do you know how you actually keep track of that right so to me is instead of thinking about the displacement and the impacts of it is let's look at the opportunities that we have ahead what are the things that we want to do you know for pro liners and, and, and ambassadors and all the things that can help the community engage better with the mobility systems out there uh jenny i want to also ask, ask you this is a question i would really love everyone on the panel to answer so how do you what do you what's your response to the question of uh labor displacement uh and ensuring that this technology doesn't lead to sort of the vanishing of an entire uh, class of workers. Yeah, I, I saw plus one everything that uh, Carlos and Henry already said. You know, the, the truth of the matter is that while there are AVs on the road, all of them have safety drivers. I mean, I think that there's maybe a few of them that don't, but all of them have safety drivers. Uh, so, so my point here is that there, there is that workforce and what's been useful, you know, even my, myself overseeing operations is that I understand what that role does. And I understand that the, the value that it brings in terms of understanding an environment. And there is so much value that that um, brings to informing how we think about developing AV technology. And as the technology evolves, there is there is going to be a need for remote monitoring, for sure. And so then how do we create paths of learning? How do we create certification programs so that folks can have those in place? And then you can really dig into workforce development programs and have that population ready to go. I mean, you know, you 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 you're going to need computer savvy, but you're also going to need people skills. You know, how do you make somebody feel comfortable over a phone line that's in a vehicle that maybe they are having a, a heart palpitation and they need help? And um, and so now you have this person who's, who's supposed to be able to communicate to the vehicle that there's an emergency and they're supposed to keep that person calm and, you know, say, hey, I need help because there's an issue in this vehicle. Th to your guys' point, there there are so many other types of, of needs that are going to come out of this. Uh, electricians, so technical development on electricians, what should we be doing in terms of advising those um, technical schools on what is going to be needed? to support on that piece or like mechanics, right? Think about when you had, you know, your regular rotary engine or, or your regular, uh, you know, uh, engine car, your six cylinder, those vehicles are super high tech. And so now just to even be a mechanic, you have to have computer skills. You have to be take, take the, the certifications that are coming out of those OEMs just to even interact with the vehicle. So th the same is true here, which is, you know, how do we create a path for learning? How do we build, uh, to, to, to your point, Henry, have those conversations head on now of what are the employment gaps that we're going to start to see as we um, build this technology so that then we can help the workforce be ready for those things. And we're, we're excited about those conversations uh, and, the, and the path planning and the opportunities that, that, that come from that. So we've just got a couple more minutes left and I want to get to a couple more of these questions. So we got one here that says that um, for the commercially uh, operated AVs in a city, so for your robo taxis, your delivery vehicles, um, what role does asking for data sharing from those entities to cities play in evaluating sort of equity outcomes, identifying issues with vehicles on the street? Carlos, you mentioned um, MDS, I believe. 
Uh, if you can maybe just talk a little bit more about that and sort of what are the, some of the potentials and do you expect any pushback at all from the companies when it comes to asking for data, data sharing? Yeah, certainly. I would love to hear from, from, from Jenny and the private sector on this, but you know, uh, for, for commercially uh, vehicles, whether AV or not, right, I think there is a, a, a need and a requirement to understand the impacts of their business and the public right away. Ultimately, there's something happening on the public right away and how we're able to impact. So um, to me, it is it's twofold, right? When we talk about the mobility data specification is first a way for cities to enable a, a clear communication of policies and telling the rules of engagement to the to the private providers on how we our city is built and how we want to, them to interact with us. But at the same time, there is some type of information that we need to start getting back in terms of how they're actually uh, getting from one place to the another in terms of the impacts, uh, the, the, the amount of time that are spending on, on the curb. You know, there is a lot of over hype term of curb management and I think we need to really get into why we need to talk about curb management and how we need to get private sector and public sector talking together about the impacts and the, and the needs to, to manage that. There's also other possible uh, uh, ideas with data sharing that I need to explore. You know, to me is if, if we have an Optimus right, which is to me a sensors on wheels, you know, is there an opportunity for us to work together to identify information that we can gather from the street that you can help public agencies to do their work, their work better? Right, in terms of keeping our streets safe and keeping our street running efficiently and smoothly. So there is a lot there to unpack. Uh, Jenny, I think you know, it will be interesting to hear from the private sector, you know, do you see any pushback? Right? To me, is we, we are custodian the public right away. It's not my space, it's the public space, and we need to make sure it's used effectively. Ultimately, there's no more area to grow. We're not going to knock out buildings to actually put more space for vehicles. We need to use what we have as, as a precious space how can we work together to making that useful? And again, you read my rules of engagement through MDS, you know, what type of information you get back to us in order to make sure that we're aligning goals. Yeah, just to quickly, because I know um, we're, we're getting to time here, um, but um, I think data sharing is super important. I think the, the biggest question is the what. What is it that is most useful? Because honestly, you guys, is, you're, you're totally right that these are, um, you know, data collecting machines on wheels. They're collecting all kinds of radar, GPS data, camera data, LiDAR, data, all these kinds of things. But so much of it can be noise. And so then to be swimming in a lot of noise then distracts us from the goals, which is how do we help people enjoy their city? Um, and so that's the conversation that we've tried to have with folks in, in Boston and DC and in other places, which is, okay, yes, we want, we want to share data. What, what is it that you want? What is it that you need? And so sometimes it's been mostly around uh, qualitative data in terms of what are the behaviors that we're seeing in certain environments in terms of, you know, either um, speed violations um, or in terms of how people are moving in an environment. That is to say, are there better ways to improve circulation, even if it's just with lane painting, for example, or to your to your point, Carlos, is, is this curb better for, um, you know, uh, pick up and drop off instead of a uh, uh, parking? for example. And so then the, the, the question really just becomes, okay, well, what is the data? And then, and then for us to figure out how do we package it so that it's easy to, to, to digest. Uh, that said, I think data sharing is important. Data sharing is good and, and data sharing needs to be done. Uh, Henry, I want to give the, the final word to you. It's sort of just to sum things up, it seems like what obligations do the AV companies have to the cities? We've seen tech companies come in in the past and sort of run roughshod uh, over a lot of the rules and regulations that exist because they feel that they're offering something that's innovative and new and that these rules were written for things in the past and that they maybe don't apply to them. I'm thinking of like Uber and Lyft, for example. Uh, I, I could easily see a scenario in which, you know, you've got uh, a, a rogue AV company that comes in and tries to deploy in a city without permission and things start to get a little bit chaotic. What obligation do you think these companies have to the cities and how do you think cities should be, be sure to enforce those rules? 
Sure. When it comes to mobility, um, this is of the utmost importance. So the AV companies have a tremendous amount of responsibility here, not only to deploy a safe product that is sustainable, that is affordable, um, that is accessible to everyone, um, but also not to um, sort of disrupt some of the other options out there. To be clear, I love autonomous vehicles, but for me, it, it's merely just one of the solutions that we need to be deploying in cities. We, we the, the best way to move around people People, as far as I've seen, is public transit. And so we have to make sure that AV companies don't um, further hurt uh, public transit, which is really important. The other piece is uh, the uh, diversity and inclusion piece, which is important. We have a, a major is issue with racism still in this country. It was built into the fabric of the, the housing industry, and that is which the transportation industry is built on top of. We have to undo decades, well, no, hundreds of years of, of oppression. We have to ensure that people are included and have a, an opportunity here. And so the AV companies are really at the center of that when you think about it uh, moving forward. If they are going to be the future of our cities, they have to understand that. Um, and it can't just be about profit, um, not um, at the risk of putting more and more people uh, at, at harm. Um, and so that is sort of my final word. Um, it, it's equity, but also getting down to the bottom of what we mean by equity. And, and it's really making sure that people can move about freely in a way that they never have before. So that's, I think that's a great way to conclude this conversation just really exceeded my expectations. All of you were fantastic. I really appreciate you, everyone taking the time uh, to come on here and, and talk about these very important issues. And I thank everyone uh, for watching and for joining us and for asking really, uh, I think really pertinent and smart questions as well. Uh, that's greatly appreciated. So uh, I'm being told that if you enjoyed this session, please learn more about the Knight Foundation's Autonomous Vehicle Workshop today at 1.30 p.m. Eastern. Uh, but right now, uh, please stay right here uh, in this space uh, and that we're gonna be coming right back with you uh, with the president of the Knight Foundation, Alberto uh, E. Barglin. Uh, he's going to be joined by uh, Felipe Chavez Cortez, who is the CEO of KiwiBot for a fireside chat. That sounds like it's gonna be really exciting, but. Uh, Jenny, Carlos, Henry, thank you guys so much. This was really fantastic. I really appreciate all of you. Uh, for yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.